start the second half of our conference. And I, I would like to invite uh, my friend Ivan Dimitrichko, who works, uh, who lives in the Belgrade survey. Uh, so, warmly welcome our next speaker. developers from a different perspective and 
hopefully it will help you to highlight some areas and to make you a better developer. And here are the initial list uh, of aspects I, will, I wanted to go through. And uh, yeah, initially there were like 12 items right now. Yeah, when I applied to the talk, uh, to the conference, there were six items. And then when, then I finally started working on my presentation, I decided that I have to reduce the number of these aspects to three so that my talk will be actually at least somewhat practical and useful. And I see a lot of young faces here, and that gives me hope that the talk is going to be useful. Um, it's not really hard, but uh, let's start with the system thinking. And the system thinking is actually a really complex thing. And if you speak Russian, then you can follow the link and learn more about system thinking. Uh, there is a guy called Anatoly Levinchuk, and he is probably the most famous person who uh, cares about system thinking in Russian. And this is his online course, and it's pretty good. In English, you can take a look at the uh, uh, standard, and there are all the definitions, but we are going to talk about two simple concepts from the system thinking, and consider it uh, a warm-up. So let's talk about roles. And, um, yeah, you remember this picture? Let's, uh, let's zoom it and enhance. And you see there's a, uh, there's a dog, and uh, there's a dog house. And uh, almost anyone can build a, a dog house. And almost anyone can build a small hut. And therefore we can call this person a builder. And experienced builder can build a small house because he built, uh, they already built few huts and small houses. So building another house is not a problem. But when it comes to building something bigger, really big house for multiple families, then it suddenly um, the skills of our builders is not enough because we have to care about electricity, we have to care about plumbing, about gas ventilation, heating, about how we're going to deliver people to our apartments, and so on and so on and so on. And what is happening in real life? Uh, it's a, comp a conceptual compression, but I guess what happens is that some person who is aware of all the, those aspects uh, delivers like, uh, a lot of different documents, diagrams, schemas, uh, we, where they describe all these aspects. Then a really smart person somehow merges all these aspects in their head and then produces the final document where, uh, with a description how exactly this building should be built exactly on this area. Well, in our case, we have something like this. The same person who built a hut then is expected to turn this hut into a small house and then to turn it into a bigger house. And for us, uh, what happens is more something more like this. Like, the person who built the hut uses the same principles to build a bigger house and then uses the, the same principles to build a really big house. And it's not surprising that uh, such systems are causing a lot of efforts and pain uh, when you have to support them. So the key idea here is that if you are going to build uh, a really big system, then skills of a developer is not enough, then you should start developing architect skills. And it's not necessarily something like uh, like was shown on the, uh, on the DDD talk because this is a, like a very uh, this architecture was done by a very profound architect. You should really uh, introduce uh, some of the aspects, and we'll talk about a few of them. And I hope they will be useful. So, and I was questioned what what could be the criteria uh, when you should start thinking about uh, 
architecture. And uh, m my opinion is that you should start thinking about it from the day one. But also, um, another question is when will you start feeling when things uh, will go wrong? And I think, uh, this is just my guess, but I think somewhere at the level of 75 plus models, you will really uh, feel the lack of architecture. Okay, another idea from system thinking is uh, life cycle. And it is useful to under understand that our project have life, life cycles and uh, during the inception stage, uh, architecture actually no, brings no value to you. And this is shown on this picture by Martin Fowler. Actually, this red line um, shows uh, it's a desired state. It means that over time we are able to deliver the same amount of uh, new features we were able to deliver before. But what usually happens is this, this blue line where um, speed of delivery decreases because of lack of architecture. But also you can see that um, in this part, in this part, no, you can't see. Uh, uh, in the, this part on the bottom, uh, there is no reason to invest in the architecture. Also, it means that we can, like, uh, can draw these stages like this, and they can be of a different length. And for example, for GitLab, their situation could look like this. They had a short inception phase, then they had a huge growth stage, and I think they saw. Uh, right now, there are some, some, they're on the iteration stage. Uh, this is a not very uh, desired situation. This is like a long inception phase where you've been working on a project maybe silently for two years without no, without releases. Then you finally release it, but nobody uh, gets the idea. You probably get several clients and you have to support them, but you have no huge success. And there is another situation, and I find this situation very relevant to us in a, to, to Rails community because startups do love Rails because we are able to deliver features quickly on the first two stages, and they do hire us. And but what really happens is that nine out of ten startups die before like uh, going to the next stages. And for us, it means we are not able to learn from our decisions. That we are going from project to project, and we are completely sure that we did everything wrong, uh, did everything correctly, and we teach others to do it the same way. But we are like uh, we don't have real experience of scaling our decisions uh, like, to be, to build them a really big house out of our decisions. So just next time when you join a project. Think about uh, what stage, uh, what what this project is, and what stage stages you will be able to participate in. All right. The next idea, and we are uh, about to start getting practical. And I have a question for the, for the audience. Um, who of you, please please raise your hands. Uh, those of you who now, what is state machine? And please keep your hands those who use it on a daily basis and who believes that it's a really important concept. Okay, fewer people. Uh, so yeah, my talk is going to be useful. Um, <laughs> all right, so let me demonstrate the idea of state first. Let's say we all have user model and user can be in different states. Invited, registered, banned, promoted, expired, maybe deleted. And also we have other models, and they also can be in, in different states. Probably invoices can be attached to tasks for, for some reason, and tasks can be assigned to users. Uh, and it means, uh, and here we get a combined effect. Like, uh, the more combinations we get, the more complicated our system becomes. But the trick is that, like, the natural way to implement states for us as developers, like when we just learning how to do stuff, is this. We use flags. 
and we love flags. And this is the code I've written several years ago. It all started with one simple condition, but then the customer asked me to add more logic, more logic, more logic, and I found myself in a situation where I don't understand where should I put my code in. So if you remove HTML, it will look a bit, uh, a bit simpler, but still it was really hard for me to understand where everything should go. And another indicator is situation like this. If you find yourself writing conditions like this, uh, you're in trouble because um, it, every time you will go through this code, uh, you will have to parse the whole thing. And what it means is that you here you try to uh, to identify the state somehow, but uh, the way you do it is very uh, uh, not not very good. You could uh, you could hide it behind a method and uh, name it somehow, but you will still have the same problem. Like you, every time you will have to introduce changes into your system, you will have to go through the whole thing, and it's getting even worse because every flag in the model you add actually doubles the number of states. So when you only have a flag like trial ended, for example. You have two states, trial ended and not ended. But with the, every next uh, flag, you double the number of states, and it means uh, that for four flags in one model, you have a possibility of 16 states. And as you remember, if something can go wrong, it will go wrong. And it means if you leave the theoretical possibility in your system to switch to the incorrect state, it somehow it, it somehow can happen. Like uh, someone will import uh, not very not validated data, or because of some bug in your system, you will get uh, incorrect data, and your system will not be able to process this data correctly. And if you have like conditions like this, uh, good luck with debugging it. I know it's good here. So, um, flags can be hidden. It's actually uh, uh, on my slide. <laughs> and uh, I mean, what I mean is that sometimes we use uh, we use dates, we use ranges or associations or status fields as flags. For example, if some association is missing, then it means that uh, our user is in this state, and it makes things even more complicated. But there is a natural solution for this, and it sounds like state machines. Um, and the key idea, one of the key ideas, is that almost everything we are doing as a programmer can be represented as state machines. And uh, this is an example of state machine. And this is what happens when, when you are trying to call a friend. And the idea of state machine is simple. You have a number of states, and you have a number of transitions between them. And that's it. And there is another state machine, like when you try, when you put in your MasterCard into an ATM, uh, here's the state machine, and like, after a third try, it gives your card, and that's it. And state machines can be complex. This is a state machine of the Docker command line utility. But still, it's a state machine and can be described with uh, this idea. Luckily, uh, we have two, two good gems for that. And I used the second one, but I think they kind of have the similar functionality. And in the code, it looks like this. You define, in your model, you define the list of states and a uh, list of events with transitions uh, from, uh, from one state to another. What it gives you, it gives you, it basically generates your list of methods, and you also can generate scopes out of it automatically. And in your code, you, it gets easier to read, so it's always explicit uh, in what state you are. And also, you can use state name as a name of the partial and make your view even more simpler. So, if there would be only one thing you will take from this talk 
it will it, it, please uh, please just use state machines, start using them. That's the only thing I, I really want you to learn from this talk. And but there's another layer on top of it because in Rails uh, models are backed by Active Record. Uh, models can be in two states, like we can go in technical states. It can be persisted or not. And it means that if we have 16 states with flags and two states like safe, non safe, now we have 32 states. You see, right? So, what to do here? Uh, try to write the code which doesn't rely on the technical state of your model. Um, your methods should treat models um, the same way no matter if they are persisted or not. It might be hard at the beginning, but it's really important. So uh, the idea here, if, if we're going to sort of summarize it, it will sound like this. You should control the number of degrees of freedom in your application. And the number of degrees of freedom is the combined number of states of uh, your, your models. All right, and and the last thing I wanted to talk about it sounds like entry point pressure, and this is don't try to Google it because I actually invented it. And um, what are entry points in our Rails applications? Uh, entry points are uh, actions in our controllers, and what I mean by pressure is something like this. So if in the controller you have like a huge list of before fillers and it's really hard to understand where each piece of the code gets executed. And because of the of because of the fact uh, that you're trying to handle too many uh, business operations and different contexts in the same action, uh, you might get a code like this. This is a single action. Yeah. So I call it uh, a very high pressure. You can use this metaphor of high pressure on a single action. And the solution is to decompress it, to identify, um, like, yeah, this is the picture that should demonstrate the, the idea of pressure somehow. And I think it goes from several assumptions. The first one is that I know that some juniors still think that REST means that we should have one model and one controller. It's not the case. And also, there is a default way to handle uh, different formats in Rails. It's RESPON2. And uh, because of this, we also, our uh, code in controllers gets more complicated. So what I suggest is to identify like a separate chunks and to move them to separate controllers. And the first principle, well, let me first demonstrate the problem with response to. On a small scale, it doesn't look, doesn't really look scary, but on a larger scale, it uh, gets scarier. So, enjoy. <laughs> what we see here, uh, what we see here is that uh, every for every case, uh, we have a different subset of subsets of data. We have different ways to generate results, and probably uh, all these um, all these uh, results will be used in a different way. But we still uh, put this in the same controller, and also the list of actions is also different. Like you, we want to have a uh, and now detection for RSS speed. So uh, the solution is to create separate REST representations. It means like several uh, separate uh, separate controllers. And one of the approaches is to use uh, top-level namespaces by the format. So if you have uh, if you have to serve JSON, you can create a namespace called API. If you have to serve PDF, you can create a top-level namespace called reports, for example, and for the regular controllers, you can put them into web. And another um, 
another approach is to use the idea of bounded context. And by bounded context, well, you already heard, but let's repeat. Uh, maybe it's a confusing word, but it's simply that, that you might have a moderation section, you might have a marketing uh, part of your business, you might have sales, support, and those are like those can be treated like sub-application, something like this. And you also create namespaces for them and you get a hierarchical structure for your controllers and this actually reduces entry point pressure and, um, and yeah, this is the principle I would for you um, to use as well. And I'd love to know how much time do I have. Oh, that's perfect. <coughs> then we can talk about uh, another concept. I remember the idea of life cycle. From the beginning, let's use it for, uh, for actually, to, for our uh, life cycle as a rail developers. I wrote this picture, uh, I invented this picture a year ago when I was uh, preparing to Ruby C uh, conference in Kiev and I used it to describe my trajectory as a Rails developer, as a Ruby developer and then I figured out that it actually describes uh, like any uh, Rails developer. So the detailed picture is, uh, you can follow this link, uh, I won't show you the detailed picture right now but yeah, you, you can't actually see anything. But um, but the idea is following. On the first stage at the bottom, we all happy with Rails. We like, we fell in love with it. We think that it's something uh, really amazing. And then, as the project grows and we started to work uh, with, on our more complicated project problems, uh, then we start getting problems with Rails. We switch to the second stage of the Rails critics, and we start. Uh, maybe not hating Rails, but seeing some difficulties and we start looking for solutions. We learn about design patterns, solid, uh, and so on and so on. And, but the trouble here is that sometimes these solutions, they, we are able to tackle complexity, but we still uh, don't get the same level of happiness we were able to get on the first stage. And because of this, uh, a lot of people switch to the third stage, where we, they decide to leave Rails community completely, whether they decide to switch to another technology, Clojure, Go, Elixir, um, Rust, Go, or I don't know, PHP, just kidding. Uh, or it's a, it's a different paradigm. We will go like completely event sourcing, or we'll go serverless or microservices. Uh, we are like, we are tired of the problems we have with Rails or like Hanami or something like this. We are going to have to deal with completely new landscape of problems. So, the trick is that there is a fourth stage and it's really hard to get there. Um, the way, like the only way I know is to learn from all those different languages, to learn from all those different paradigms and then uh, bring these concepts and these ideas back into Rails. And it's actually doable. I was able to, to learn uh, this approach from one person and uh, I'm trying hard, uh, trying to write it down, trying to find an easy way to transfer this knowledge to other people. And one of the, one of the attempts is this list. I tried to formulate the list of uh, painless Rails principles and you can use it as a checklist. You can check yourself whether the way you use Rails, the way you write web applications complies to those principles. If it is, then probably when the code base grows, you won't have serious problems. If, it is, if it's not, then you might get problems. And you still can uh, learn these things and these concepts by yourself. Uh, this is the list of books you uh, might want to get through. 
The problem is that not a single one uh, has a mention of Ruby or Rails, so it's just pure idea, so maybe uh, even other languages. So, as I said, you have to get the ideas and then transfer them to the way you work first. Uh, if you want to learn more, you can uh, sign up uh, here. This is a mini core, mini email course, which I extracted from the book I'm writing, and uh, and that's uh, it. Thank you. If you have any question, I'll be happy to answer you. So, uh, we saw this design stamina hypothesis chart, so my question is, what is good design? Because we saw like there is no design and good design, so what is good design? And uh, are there any numbers? Because as far as I know, that chart uh, is a conjecture, there is no objective proof to it, and there are no numbers whatsoever, so if you apply any scale to this chart, it can drastically change. So, yeah, what is good design and what are the numbers? Yeah, it's a, it's a hypothesis, you are, you are right. And as for what is good design, um, I think there should be a, like, a separate conference for that. Uh, because what I tried to do in my talk, I, was, I was wanted to show several concept, concepts which will lead you to a good design. And uh, if you really want to, to modify the way you write, uh, you develop applications, and you want to, them to have a good design, you should be aware of somewhat like 10 or maybe 15 concepts. That's the idea. Yeah, uh, that still kind of doesn't answer my question because what if I don't lead to, uh, what if I don't go towards good design? I mean, so we want to start on the premise what a good design is to kind of understand if I want to go this way. So is, is good design like using state machines uh, and uh, low density entry points? It is one of it, it, the, these are two aspects you should like comply here. You should care about. Like otherwise you're like, this is your situation. But there are more to it, yeah. I, I simply like have no time to, to talk about right now. I can answer you later. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Hi, uh, thank you for um, the presentation. Could you turn back one slide, please? No. This one? This one, yes. Isn't uh, the picture on the right this uh, monolith, monstrous monolith, uh, which uh, a big part of our industry is running from. This is the first question. And the second, the practical one, which uh, state machine gem would you recommend? Because there are four or five, and uh, one of them is difficult to understand okay. what should be used. Thank you. So as for the gems, I know two of them. I showed them. One is AS. AASM, Access State Machine, another one is State Machines. I used the second one, but I believe they are kind of a similar, they have similar functionality, so. Uh, the trick is that they provide uh, actually too much functionality. They provide something like callbacks. Please don't use it. Like, like everything, everything like you saw the, let me find it. I show you like this is the everything you need for your state machines. Yeah, it's that's it. Yeah. Like sometimes you you will uh, you will have to put some conditional validations into your inside the state, but uh, usually it should be really simple. Because it can get messy too if you like start using all the features, but yeah, that's it. Okay. Well, basically, uh, you don't need the gem at all because you you 
can just create a hash with uh, your transition table and uh, you might send the key with the current, current value and uh, you will receive the value with uh, your uh, possible transitions. So you don't need a gap. Yeah. I thought you were trying to remove it from stage. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the, the second question was about monolith. And um, I think that the, uh, the reason why we are trying to escape monoliths is that we don't, uh, we are trying to introduce um, boundaries so that uh, we don't, so that, like, so that we have like a number of separate huts like this, so that it won't turn into this uh, like situation, right? So, and the answer is, if you if you learn about good design, your monolith application will be fine. And it's actually, uh, what to say? I highly recommend to go through through this stage. Uh, before you start to switch in, uh, to microservices or something like this. As I said, there you will have a completely new landscape of problems. And if you don't know how to deal with the problems uh, of monoliths, it will be even harder for you. It might be even harder for you. Thank you. something um, because all logic of was tied uh, behind all bags of state machine and uh, maybe you have some some advice how to be it. Thank you for your question. As I said, try not to use all the features provided by gems, like try not to use um, callbacks inside state machines. Use it as a way to define rules of your model. Like, uh, you always have to think uh, what idea you're implementing using some solutions. Like, there, behind every gem, behind, behind every uh, decision to use um, like some certain building block, there should be an idea. And um, a specific solution doesn't uh, always follow your idea, like the, the idea you have behind. And um, this is like, this is up to you. This is like another part of uh, skill of good design. But uh, from my perspective, yeah, it can get messy because you have to, uh, sometimes you have to remodel the whole thing and you have to mm, rename maybe half of your events and then it can get harder. And also, like you might be in a situation where you, where one model can have multiple state machines, and it's also important not to mix them into one. That's that's like from my experience, what I know. Thank you.